Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And though I told you last week that I was unlikely to do any videos between Christmas and New Year's, I also didn't anticipate that our friends in the plaintiff's bar at the Rosen Law Firm would be filing a securities class action lawsuit on, I believe, Christmas Eve. And thank you to everybody that linked this to me on Christmas Eve and on Christmas Day. And if you haven't followed this story here in Virtual Legality, we've been talking about the release of Cyberpunk 2077 and the statements and refunds and removals from the Sony store that happened along with it for a little bit of time now, including in our most recent video, would there be a lawsuit against CD Projekt and against CD Projekt Red for what amounts to fraud on the market? falsely stating things to investors that inflated the price and damaged people that were relying upon them. We commented in that video on the most likely avenue for a complaint to be filed against CD Projekt, which was this, Rule 10b-5 in the United States that says it's illegal to make an untrue statement of a material fact, an important fact, or to skip making a statement about a material fact that leaves the things that are true misleading because you failed to say that other thing. We said, hey, if there's going to be a complaint against the company, it's very likely to be on these grounds. And as I said, the Rosen Law Firm delivered on their investigation statement and filed a complaint against CD Projekt really late on Christmas Eve. Now you'll see here, this is the document that you will actually link to if you go to the Rosen Law Firm, say, hey, I'm interested in being a part of this class. They link you to this complaint. This was not the version as filed. You can see there's a blank listed here for the plaintiff. And Andrew Trampy is apparently the named plaintiff in the version that was filed as put up on the internet by Polygon. But I want to use the one that they would have you look at if you were to join the class with them to jump off and to talk about what it is that they are alleging. First, the fact that there's a blank plaintiff is entirely suggestive of how this process works from a class action standpoint. If you're not familiar with class actions, you hear that term a lot in TV and movies and things. It's basically a lawsuit that allows one plaintiff to represent all of the other people that are quote unquote similarly situated. You see there individually and on behalf of all other similarly situated. So they're going to define a time frame in which everybody that bought CD Projekt stock, or in this case, as it's filed in the United States, ADRs, deposit receipts that represent that stock in United States American financial institutions. And they're going to say those are similarly situated. And so we can have one person that represents that class. We don't have to sue 10,000, 100,000 times. And that class action system can be a good thing. But it does lead to this race to the courthouse, which is what you see here. You see that's why it's listed in blank. That's why you see five different law firms actually say, hey, we were are looking for a lead plaintiff. You should consider us if you were a purchaser of CD Projekt stock and you want to potentially sue them over it. Now, I've pulled up a JD Supra summary of what this looks like from the company side. This is a white and case. This is another law firm summary that says, hey, the original complaint is sometimes followed by virtually identical complaints. These initial complaints will typically be consolidated into one action. And I brought this up because a lot of people on Twitter were pointing me to various commenters in the video game community saying, hey, this is only one lawsuit. There's actually two, three, four, five other law firms that are thinking about bringing a lawsuit. I put out a statement at that same time that said, well, that's not really the biggest deal in the world because CD Projekt is only ever going to be liable for the one set of facts in 2020 to the extent that they are on one basis. If you're going to have a, a number of law firms file and one lead plaintiff is picked out, one lead plaintiff is going to run a consolidated action, right? They say the original complaint, which is what we're going to be reading today, is typically drafted hastily, does not contain much detail because plaintiffs know that the operative complaint, the real one as amended, will not be filed until after the lead plaintiff and lead counsel are selected. Right. And what is that? Well, the original plaintiff files a notice announcing the class action in a national publication within 20 days of filing. Within 60 days of that notice, any member of the class may move the court to serve as lead plaintiff. So when we look at Andrew Trampy here, it's essentially a placeholder that this firm, the Rosen Law Firm, wanted to get filed first. And now we're going to see who the actual lead plaintiff is. And why is that important? Well, it's because of the next line. The court then appoints a lead plaintiff or a group of lead plaintiffs who select the lead counsel. And why are all these law firms doing this? And there's nothing wrong with this, but this is how the system works. Why are all these law firms doing this? Because if their lead counsel is the one selected, they're the ones getting paid, 
So these law firms get their filings in as fast as possible. Why? Because it used to be the case that a fast filing basically meant that your guy was going to be the lead plaintiff. So there was this race to the courthouse. Now in the mid nineties, there was an effort to kind of tamp down on what was seen as frivolous lawsuits, particularly in securities class actions like this one. And so they put forward a bit of law that says there's a presumption actually that sure the filing of the complaint matters, but also we want the party that has the largest financial interest in the class action to be that lead plaintiff. If your damages are so much higher than some other members of the class, then that should matter more than just the fact that you signed on with the Rosen Law Firm or whomever, any of a number of other law firms first and got filed in the court. Now, all of this is basically up to the court. There are various things that they uh, look at, that they analyze to determine who the laid plaintiff is, but obviously the Rosen Law Firm and really the rest of the class action bar thinks that it is useful to get their filing in first, which is why you see things like this where it's in blank, where we don't have a plaintiff. Plaintiff blank, individually and on behalf of all other persons similarly situated, alleges the following based on his personal knowledge as to the plaintiff and the plaintiff's own acts and information and belief as to all other matters based on the investigation conducted by and through his attorneys, right? This process is driven by plaintiff's counsel, class action counsel. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a lot of usefulness in terms of this acting as a kind of bounty system for attorneys to go get paid. These are all going to be done on contingent basis. So they get paid if they are able to extract damages from the company in question. And that contingent basis allows a lot of firms to go in and say, hey, I want to represent you. I'm going to do a good job. I'm going to get you guys money. Other people would point out that that does generally mean that the lawyers get paid the most or an insignificant addition to what the actual people that are damaged by this uh, receive. But that is, in fact, the way it works. And as you will see here, as the, the investigation through his attorneys is described, what is described is effectively a virtual legality episode, right? Which included, among other things, a review of defendants' public documents, conference calls and announcements made by defendants, public filings, wire and press releases published by and regarding CD Projekt, and information readily obtainable on the internet. Yep. What they do on this is look at what we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks with respect to CD Projekt and say, hey, you know, if this is the state of play right now, if you've got a big loss in your stock market price, why did that happen? Well, it's when Sony cut you off from sales on the Sony platform or when you issued your refund statement. Okay, what did you say before that that maybe was a lie? And then you basically back research into a lawsuit like this one. It's one of the reasons why earlier in this series, I said whenever you have a loss, like you saw with respect to CD Projekt, which is significant percentages of the value of their stock, of the ADRs here in the United States, then effectively, you get those investigation letters that we saw from these law firms that say, hey, anybody interested in talking to me about all this? Because there's probably a potential lawsuit available. Continuing, plaintiff believes that substantial evidentiary support will exist for the allegations set forth herein after a reasonable opportunity for discovery. Again, this is hastily drafted and put together. This says, hey, we looked at everything online. We looked at the public statements. We don't have any extra information. The plaintiff ne hasn't necessarily brought us extra information. In fact, they're not even named in this version of the document. But we are sure that when we get a chance to look at their emails and look at their memos and look at everything else internally, that this is going to bear fruit. That just from what we can see, the tip of the iceberg in terms of public communication suggests some fraud, some deceit, some misstatement that we will find court as long as you certify the class and allow us to proceed into discovery. Now, what do they actually want in terms of the class period here? They frame it as follows. This is a class action on behalf of persons or entities who purchased or otherwise acquired publicly traded CD Projekt securities between January 16th, 2020 and December 17th, 2020. Now, does that, name, that, does that date, that January 16th date ring a bell? It should. On January 16th is when CD Projekt put out this statement. We have important news regarding our release date. We won't make that April release window. April seems such a, such a far time away now, especially when we see how Cyberpunk 2077 actually released. They say in that statement, we are currently at a stage where the game is complete and playable, but there's still work to be done. And you'll see in this lawsuit that they highlight that complete and playable notion in a couple of places. So they want to say that the people that were damaged were everybody that purchased stock 
between that announcement on January 16th and on December 17th, which is going to be pretty close to when they were locking up their complaint. The claims asserted here arise under and pursuant to 10B, that's that 10B5 rule we just talked about, and 20A, which we'll get to in a bit, but really is designed to attach to the individuals responsible and not just the company. Defendant CD Projekt Red engages in the development and digital distribution of video games. And then three more defendants, Adam Mikhail Kaczynski, and I apologize in advance for all these, the Joint Executive Officer, Neil Lubowicz, Chief Financial Officer, and Noah Kowski, Vice President of Business Development and member of the management board throughout the class period. Now, if you've been with us in virtual legality for a little while, those names probably ring a bell as well. We did a video called CDPR, should probably stop talking, which seems more prescient as the days go on. But on that video, we talked about the conference call that they had to try to assuage investor fears after they issued a refund notice that said, hey, we know it's not the way we wanted it. We didn't show you images of the old generation. And on that call, it was these folks, as well as one other that isn't named, Marcin Nowinski, the other joint CEO, and why he wasn't named is an open question. They don't really reference him in the complaint. I don't know why he wasn't named. If you go into that transcript, you see some of his answers are the most significant. I've highlighted them extensively to point out areas in which I thought they were really walking the line with what they were saying. Here's one of Mr. Zinsky's uh, answers that just goes on and on and on and is just red and orange and red and orange, but he isn't named as a defendant here. He isn't going to be liable if this were the complaint as finalized in this particular action. And the reason he's not named might be because they couldn't say this about him. They want to say about the defendants that they participated in management. They were directly involved in day-to-day operations. They had confidential proprietary information. They were directly or indirectly involved in disseminating the false and misleading statements. They were directly or indirectly involved in maintaining the company's internal controls. They were aware of or recklessly disregarded the fact that the false and misleading statements were being made by the company. They approved or ratified those statements. They were responsible, right? One of the things that they're going to try to establish in this complaint is that not only did the company do this thing as a company, but that these three individuals were the individuals that were most responsible for making sure the company said these things that had the direct effect of defrauding the market. Or as we get to in paragraphs 14 and 15, the company is liable for the acts of the individual defendants and its employees under the doctrine of respondeat superior. When you're doing something in the capacity of an employee for your company, then the company is liable for your acts there under. The scientor, the state of mind of the individual defendants and other employees and agents of the company is similarly imputed to the company. So because they had this control, because they did these things, we can't impute a state of mind to an entity like a company that's a legal fiction. So you have to go through an individual and they establish that the individual or they complain that the individual had these required elements of the crime. And so the company should be liable. Then we get to some of the substantive allegations. And here is where this law firm has plucked out what they think are ostensibly the most important false and misleading statements. First, we see they use definitions to avoid the problem we saw in the transcripts from CD Projekt in terms of describing the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X as next generation consoles. Although you'll note here that the lawyers call it an Xbox X, which is arguably worse than Series X. And then the old generation is Xbox Series One. So, you know, we've got issues with the naming, even in this document, that's probably going to be a problem throughout any of these documents that you read from law firms that probably aren't that terribly invested in the video game ecosystem. Now, in terms of those false statements, we see on January 16th that they said it was complete and playable. Now, when we look at this, you'll get my commentary on this, the strength and weakness of this complaint as we go through here. When we look at 10b-5, it is important to note that the statement actually has to be untrue. And if there's going to be an omission, that that omission has to be of a fact that is true and that needs to be told. And one of the things that you avoid getting into trouble under this rule by, if you're running a company or you're making statements out to the public, is you say things like, it's playable. And obviously in the framework of the statement, you've said it's playable, but there's work to be done. I don't know that a reasonable-minded person would look at that statement and say that, 
it needed to be able to be run perfectly at that moment in time. Playable to me means that you can effectively brute force it through from the beginning to the end of the game. And I really don't have any doubt that you can brute force Cyberpunk 2077 on the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One all the way through to the end of the game if you're willing to deal with low frame rates and crashes and bugs and all sorts of other nasty business that is going to prevent you from having fun in doing so. But the fun isn't at issue when we talk about securities actions. The issue is, did they lie? They continue on with other statements. April 8th, the board justified the decision to move the game back by pointing out the need for additional time to fully play test, bug fix, and polish the game, thus ensuring that customers receive a top quality product. Now you say, okay, Rick, well, they clearly didn't get a top quality product if you bought it on the PlayStation 4 or Xbox One when it came out. But this is the kind of statement that is forward looking, right? As of April, they don't know how it's going to turn out. This is why we delayed it to September and to November and to December ultimately. And that was to try to polish this thing and get a version of the game out that people would be satisfied with. They're going to focus, I would imagine, on this word insuring to suggest that they thought they could guarantee it, but there's never a guarantee in software development. And again, this one comes out and is pretty weak-ish on its own, but they're establishing a tableau, right? They're, They're weaving a tapestry of statements that, if not false, are at least put together in a framework that could be considered misleading. Continuing in September, we say, Hey, we are confirming, and well, actually today we started preparing for the final certification, so we're very close. We know that certification actually went through about this time, so that's not a lie. It's a huge game, but as we said, everything is on track, and we're planning to launch it on 19th November. Now, we know that it gets delayed again from that 19th November release date, so we know that they think everything is on track. It clearly wasn't on track. And you can start to create a circumstantial set of evidence that says, okay, well, it didn't come out in April. It didn't come out in September. It didn't come out in November. It didn't, it only came out in December. And should it have really come out then to suggest that they knew that there was a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes and that all of these statements are lies, but on its face, if we don't have that circumstantial evidence kind of backing up that presumption, you don't have a lie here. Everything is on track is not the kind of thing that is ordinarily a lie unless you can show that email or other communication that's contemporary in us to this statement that is actually this guy saying, oh, behind the scenes, we are not anywhere close to on track. And that's one of the reasons that this complaint gets filed and that you have a lawsuit like this is they want to go have discovery and go find contemporaneous statements to what is public facing internally to try to go establish that they knew things were a lot worse than they were letting on. The current version, continuing with the CD Projekt statement, which will be released in November, it wasn't, will be playable from the beginning. When next-gen consoles are released, you will be able to play the current-gen version on next-gen from day one. And I don't know why that was included in this lawsuit. That's 100% true. In fact, if you want to play Cyberpunk on a console, chances are your best experience is playing the old-gen versions on the next-gen boxes. In October, they continued with a few more statements. Even though the game has been certified on the current gens by both Sony and Microsoft, some very final optimization processes for such a massive and complex game require a bit of additional time. Now, in their actual transcript that we were looking at in early December, you'll do note that they actually say, hey, the certification process, we kind of cheated a little bit. That Sony and Microsoft maybe gave us a little bit of leeway, expected us to fix these things, and we failed them. And it was that kind of statement and the refund statements that I think really resulted in Sony dropping the hammer on them and removing them from the store. Microsoft didn't, and that might be a part of this story as well. But at the end of the day, I am surprised that you don't actually get that statement in this lawsuit where they comment on the fact that certification was kind of cheated a little bit. That doesn't appear in this complaint at all. He elaborated that the game is releasable on the 19th, And having those three more weeks just gives us more changes to fix this and that so we feel secure. Indeed, the game probably was releasable insofar as it launched. You saw that response in their transcript that said, hey, I know people are upset about the performance, but the game launches. It's not like it's broken, which is a terrible thing to say to the market, but also not necessarily a lie. On that call, they say, I wouldn't say there's a problem with the release because there's nothing wrong with the Xbox or PS4 versions. Nothing wrong is pretty strong in this context. There is optimization to be handled also because of how we were approaching things from the get-go in terms of development. So there is no problem with Xbox or PlayStation 4, to be honest. Then you get a statement in late uh, November, 
positive impressions on the part of journalists, and, and in particular their remarks which underscore the complexity and amazing ambiance of Night City make us very happy and confirm the remarkable potential of cyberpunk. And there's no real falsities there, so I'm not entirely certain what that paragraph is doing. We believe that the game is performing great on every platform. And then elaborated by saying we are excited to be able to bring our game to more players than ever before. The extra time gained by postponing the release is being used to further optimize the game, and we feel that it was the right decision. This paragraph, again, is kind of showing where I think some of the weakness is here. They highlight, we believe that the game is performing great on every platform, presumably to focus on a its performance as a game is not great on the Xbox One and PlayStation 4, but at least in the context given in the remaining paragraphs here, it is suggestive of the fact that CD Projekt was actually stating that they were happy with the sales. Because as of the time frame of this call, the game hasn't released. We're looking at November. We believe the game is performing great on every platform. It's going to be launched everywhere. We're excited to bring it to everybody. Postponing it was the right decision. That strikes me as a sales opinion. We believe that we are going to sell through a lot, which of course was backed up by their release shortly after the launch of the game that said they had more pre-orders than basically anybody. I think they announced eight pre, eight million pre-orders uh, for Cyberpunk 2077. So I'm not sure that this isn't being taken out of context as well. We get to paragraph 25 and we see in that same call, so in terms of bugs, we are all aware of them. Of course, such a big game can't be bug free. That's kind of obvious, but we believe that the level will be as low as to let gamers not see them. Now, that obviously was never going to happen. Honestly, realistically, that was not going to occur in an open world game. And it really hasn't occurred in The Witcher or any other open world game that you are likely to think of. But that we believe is doing work there as well. We believe that the level will be as low as to let gamers not see them. You have to start to establish that that in and of itself is reckless disregard for the truth. Wasn't something that they actually believed at the time. The statement in and of itself is not necessarily the kind of falsity that usually results in securities liability. Their final statement here, the, the Rosen Law Firm here in paragraph 26, says the statements contained in those upper paragraphs, the ones we just read, were materially false and or misleading because they misrepresented and failed to disclose the following adverse facts. One, Cyberpunk 2077 was virtually unplayable on the current generation Xbox or PlayStation systems due to an enormous amount of bugs. That is the primary issue here. They want to say that that set of statements, the set of facts underlying those statements, were hiding the fact that this wasn't going to be playable on the old gen systems in any functional way. From there, we get more far afield. As a result, Sony would remove Cyberpunk 2077 from the PlayStation Store, and Sony, Microsoft, and the company would be forced to offer full refunds for the game. So, as a result, we've already gone one step past what their statements are actually about, right? So, we've got specifically defendants made false or misleading statements or failed to disclose that as a result, Sony would remove Cyberpunk 2077. That's not something that CD Projekt or CD Projekt Red could have possibly known at the time that the statements were made. And belying the fact that they couldn't have possibly known that is the fact that Microsoft didn't take it down. Right? The fact that Microsoft didn't take it down suggests that there were two in, two different ways to go here. Microsoft thought that a warning was just fine. Sony thought that a warning wasn't fine and removed it from the store. But there are other things that happened there as well, which is the statements that the company made. Bad business decisions that led to Sony removing it from the store. But note, bad business decisions aren't on trial here. One of the best defenses that CD Projekt probably has to all of these actions is that we made legitimate mistakes in the interest of trying to serve a market. Those mistakes were made not through fraud, not through artifice or deception. We didn't mean to imply anything wrongly to the market. When we said those things, they were truthful. It just didn't come out the way we wanted. We are bad managers. We made a bad video game. We made some bad mistakes. We shouldn't have treated Sony like that. We should have talked to them about refunds before going out with the refund statement. Those are all true facts. We did bad things. That doesn't make you liable to your investors. In fact, investors should be discounting and saying, those guys are bad managers. That's not the same as lying to the market. So this first one could potentially be a lie. 
It was virtually unplayable. We really didn't say that throughout the year. And we're going to have to show through discovery, if you're on the Rosen Law Firm team, that CD Projekt knew things were a lot worse than they actually were letting on and let the stock price not reflect that fact. Then we get to, as a result, Sony would remove it. I don't think that's a very good argument. Then we get to another step. Consequently, the company would suffer reputational and pecuniary harm. It would be hurt by these things. I don't even know what that's doing here. As a result of that, defendant statements about its business operations and prospects were materially false. Specifically, defendants made false or misleading statements that failed to disclose that, as a result of everything that happened, defendant statements were false. They made a false statement failing to disclose that their statements were false. Uh, As you can see, we're starting to get pretty far afield. And as was suggested in the other documents that we read, this is pretty hastily drafted. But the the takeaway here is that the lawsuit is CD Projekt was hiding the fact that the game performance was unplayable on the old generations. And one thing that doesn't appear in this complaint is currently drafted that I think is very useful to the argument being made by the plaintiff here is that they deliberately hid video of those versions throughout the development process. And they had a very strong NDA and very close held documents that prevented people, reviewers, analysts from actually talking about those versions and any other version really of Cyberpunk 2077. And those all suggest that you are hiding something, that you are trying to omit statements, even if you maybe didn't make statements that on their face violate either the letter of the law or the spirit of the law. You start to create this whole circumstantial picture That's not in this complaint at present, which is why I think the complaint at present is weak, but not maybe the entirety of what a lead plaintiff and a realistic complaint after that lead plaintiff is named could bring to this particular party. So while I'm going to finish up this video and say this is a pretty weak complaint on its face, it's not that I think that there isn't potentially an action here. It's that this is very early days and it's ultimately going to come down to who the lead plaintiff is, who the law firm is, and filing an amended and final complaint that really goes into detail on all of these issues. The truth emerges is the next section from the Rosen Law Firm here. Consumers soon discovered that the current generation console versions of Cyberpunk 2077 were error-laden and difficult to play. IGN published a scathing review stating that the console versions fail to hit even the lowest bar of technical quality one should expect, which does sound like legal language, uh, admittedly IGN, even when playing on lower end hardware. Cyberpunk 2077 performs so poorly that it makes combat driving and what is otherwise a mastercraft of storytelling legitimately difficult to look at. I might have ellipsed that mastercraft of storytelling, but fair enough. As of the transcript of the call we looked at, they admitted that we underestimated the scale and complexity of the issues facing the older generation. We ignored the signals about the need for additional time to refine the game on those consoles. We definitely did not spend enough time looking at that. The stock fell 25%. Sony removed it. It fell again, another 15%. All these things hurt investors. There's no question. The question is whether there's a legally cognizable claim that the investors can make against the company. The members of the class are so numerous that joiners of all members is impracticable. Throughout the class period, the company's securities were actively traded. While the exact number of class members is unknown to plaintiff at this time and can be ascertained only through appropriate discovery, plaintiff believes that there are hundreds or thousands of members in the proposed class. This whole section, plaintiff's class action allegations, is about establishing why a class action versus a single court case is the best way to handle issues like this. This is actually pretty easy from a security standpoint. Plaintiff's claims are typical of the claims of the members of the class. Common questions of law, in fact, exist. Whether defendants' acts, as alleged, violated the federal securities laws. Whether defendants' statements to the investing public during the class period misrepresented material facts. Whether defendants' statements to the investing public during the class period omitted material facts. And again, you probably recognize all that language now is coming from 10b-5b. Don't lie and don't omit to say things that result in the rest of your statements reading as lies. Whether the prices of the company's securities during the class period were artificially inflated because of those misrepresentations. And as we talked about in our earlier video, this is all based on fraud on the market concepts. Plaintiff will rely in part upon the presumption of reliance established by the fraud on the market doctrine. In that, among other things, the misrepresentations and omissions alleged would tend to induce a reasonable investor to misjudge the value of the company's securities. Count one against all defendants. During the class period, the company and the individual defendants individually and in concert, directly or indirectly, disseminated or approved the false statements specified above, which they knew or deliberately disregarded were misleading. 
in that they contained misrepresentations and failed to disclose material facts necessary in order to make the statements made in light of the circumstances under which they were made not misleading. And again, you can see that this is an off-the-shelf kind of complaint. The parts that were filled in were the parts that we read, where they pluck all of those quotes. There's a brief description of what CD Projekt actually does. Those are the parts that are filled in to all the rest of this is off the shelf, right? It's very easy that a 10b5 allegation against a company that made a misrepresentation mostly looks the same. Hey, this is why a class is important. This is why 10b5 is important. The company and the individual defendants acted with Cienter. They knew what they were doing in that they knew that the public documents and statements issued or disseminated in the name of the company were materially false and misleading, knew that the statements or documents would be issued to the investing public, knowingly participated or acquiesced in the issuance of dissemination of such statements or documents as a primary violation of the securities laws. They knew what they were doing. They had a reckless disregard for the truth. Plaintiff and the other members of the class relied on those statements. Had plaintiff and other members of the class been aware of the truth, they would not have purchased the company's securities at the artificially inflated prices that they did or at all. By reason of the foregoing, the company and the individual defendants have violated Section 10B of the 1934 Act and Rule 10B-5. So, end of the day, that's the main count. The second count here is under 20A. And that basically says that officers and directors of a company that they control are responsible for what the company is responsible for. If we actually go and we look at this particular point uh, in the act, every person who directly or indirectly controls any person liable under any provision of this chapter shall also be liable unless the controlling person acted in good faith and did not directly or indirectly induce the act or acts constituting the violation or cause of action. So it's not everybody. It's only the people that actually did the thing for the company, but they want individuals to potentially be liable. And we've got various sections here that say that. Prayer for relief, we would require the defendants to pay damages sustained by the plaintiff and award plaintiff and the other members of the class pre-judgment and post-judgment interest, as well as uh, just court, as well as their attorney's fees, uh, if you wouldn't mind. We'd, we'd like our fees and costs. That's that's actually why we do this. Respectfully submitted the, the, the Rosen Law Firm. Remember those attorney's fees, uh, if you would. And in case you're wondering, I'm going to link a document that talks about damages and how they are ascertained in an action like this one. If they were to win uh, all the way at the end of a litigation, there would be probably out-of-pocket damages. The difference between the inflation in value of the share at the time it was purchased and the inflation that remained at the time the share was sold or the losses caused directly by the fraud, actual share price declines, or as prescribed in the statute related to Securities Act stuff in the United States. And so you can go and you can check that out. But at the end of the day, if you get past discovery, you start to get into settlement areas and almost all of them would settle. The company would figure out a number that required them to pay the folks that were otherwise quote unquote damaged, but not go all the way through litigation, not have to go through discovery, not get some potentially dirty laundry out there for the public to consume. So a lot of these are settled at the end of the day if they do survive the certification of the class and the discovery process. And that's really this case as represented today. I know a number of you linked it to me and wanted to talk about this. I think we are still in a place where we have to see what the lead plaintiff is going to look like in a case like this, whether the class is going to be certified, what that consolidated complaint ultimately winds up looking like. But right now, as it stands, this document to me is not terribly compelling. You have failed to really assert that what CD Projekt and CD Projekt Red went out there with was a lie, was a material misstatement, even though, as you know, from an 11 video series, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence they might have known things were going in a different direction. And that might not be the fault of the Rosen Law Firm or the other plaintiff's class action bar members that you'll see file lawsuits on this. You really do have to get to discovery to establish some of this stuff. But right now, I would have expected to see some more circumstantial evidence, stuff like hiding the videos of the old generation platforms. And we will see where this goes. Now, as I said earlier in the video, I am not anticipating doing a lot of videos this week. So this might be the last time I talk to you in 2020. If it is, have a wonderful new year. Otherwise, if something pops up, of course, I'll be here and I'll do a video. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you like this, please like, subscribe, share, ring the bell, do all the other good things that people ask you to do on YouTube. Otherwise, if you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will see you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. 
If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.